Okay, walking. Uh, I'm. Let's see if we can. Maybe I'll try and move this just a little more this way. Um, okay, so uh, I'm. Uh, I've upped the resolution. There were several people that were uh, uh, mentioned. They had trouble following uh, the 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 program listing because of the resolution. So I've increased the resolution. Hopefully, it'll be more visible. But I, I'm I'll actually write try and write out most of the things today. So I'm going to spend a little more time talking about the instruction set, and uh, I may I may talk a little bit about the program. Um, I don't know. Uh, we haven't gotten the snaps in yet, so uh, we probably just uh, we're probably not going to be able to get the lab done this week, which means we'll probably just slide everything back a week. And that's okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I might even just delete the lab for this week and start with the lab next week because it's it's a, it's only a little bit different anyway, uh, and you can just do the lab from this week um, kind of on your own if you want, but we won't won't count it and you don't have to do a video or turn anything in. We'll see. I'll, I'll let you know for sure. Um, we'll sort of see when we get the snaps, but. Um, because everybody is going to need a snap to program their chip, and if you can't program your chip, then you can't really run the code. Okay, so um, what I want to do uh, today is talk about assembly language. But first, I'm going to uh, we're going to cover the cover the uh, let's see the uh, syllabus. So here's the syllabus. I'm going to shoot this down here a little bit. Yeah. Okay, and I might even tuck myself down here a little bit more. Okay, so here's the syllabus, and if we go all the way to uh, where we have the schedule, right here, so we can see we're here. We are. Um, it'll be September third, and uh, so we're going to talk. We will talk about memory organization, and we'll also talk about uh, the uh, assembly language instruction set, which was really coming up on um, uh, on next Tuesday as well um, so I I probably won't do the little demo today I'll probably do that uh, on uh, next Tuesday um, let me write that but I will do that next Tuesday and then like I say we'll probably just skip the lab for this week all I want you to do is go ahead and get your board get your board soldered together and uh, be ready to uh, start labs next week. And we w should be able to get programmers to everybody next week. That's the hope. Okay. Um, all right. Then let me, uh, I want to start over here with where we left off. And so you can see uh, this was the block diagram. And I tried, I kind of went through things and I wanted to do this again. And I'm going to put my little face back here, but it'll keep going away, I guess. Um, well, maybe I'll shrink this down just a little bit. Uh, well, no, I can't do that. Okay, so anyway. So whatever. So the first thing. Um, so uh, we have the, the program memory. And remember, the program memory is separate from the data memory, the, the random access memory and from the little 256 bytes of EEPROM. This program memory uh, in this family could be uh, up to 32K, but we only have 8K. And each word in this program memory is 14 bits. It has a data bus and an address bus that connect it. And the, the address bus has to be 15 bits wide because it could be up to 32 bits, but it's not on this chip. It's only 8, uh, 8K. It could, could be up, to, sorry, not. Could be up to 32K, which means 15 bits. But it's not, it's only 8K, but we still have a 15-bit address bus. The data bus has to be 14 bits because every location is 14 bits. And when we read a instruction from the program memory, we bring the entire instruction into the CPU. Uh, and that comes in on a 14-bit wide data bus. All right, so next we have our random access memory. It's 8 bits wide. It has an 8-bit data bus. You need to be able to read and write. Uh, and also on this one, it's those, the buses are the data buses are bidirectional. Although normally we don't write to program memory, but we can. 
uh, the chip has that ability. Uh, it has that ability for a couple reasons. One, when you program it, you use the in, in you use the in circuit serial programmer, which means that the chip itself has a little module that's writing to program memory. Secondly, uh, the chip does have the ability to have to uh, to do bootstrap and to uh, to basically have a little uh, program that can read in uh, the rest of the program and write it to program memory. Uh, so, uh, and you can actually program these chips that way. That's the way the Arduino works, and, and these chips can work that way too. But we but we are not using them that way because we want to use a uh, we want to be able to use a debug program while the chip is running, and to do that we need to have the programmer. All right. So anyway, we have the RAM over here, eight bits wide, has its own address bus and data bus. That same address and data bus also handles all of the other, all of the peripheral modules, all the special function registers, all the all the 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 I/O pins for the GPIO uh, pins. All right. And the data bus is eight bits wide. It's bidirectional. The address bus. How wide is the address bus? Well, it turns out it's twelve bits wide. Uh, and we'll cover this in great detail. But here's one piece of information that's very important to know. When, when an instruction, one of these instructions up here in our program memory, comes into the CPU is in, is, and is decoded, only seven bits of the, four, of the 12 bit address bus are in the actual instruction if it references a location in memory, in data memory. And the other five bits are in the bank select register, the BSR. Now, if it uses indirect addressing, then there are 16 bits in the indirect address registers, which you load eight bits at a time. And those can also reference any of the locations uh, in, in, the, uh, in the data side and any locations in the program memory side. Uh, and that's why they have 15 bits. It gives them the ability to do uh, up to 65,000 locations. And we only have a max of 32K here and much less than that here. And so it actually lets it address these locations in, in a couple different ways, including being able to address the random access memory as a contiguous block or in separate pages. Okay, so anyway, <clears throat> the next thing we have uh, is we have this little 256 bytes of EEPROM. Now, Certainly, the flash is also EEPROM. The difference is the flash has to be addressed several locations at a time, has to be erased several locations at a time, whereas in the EEPROM, you can erase a single location and rewrite it. Uh, and so this allows you to basically have a non volatile place where you can store data. You could theoretically do that in the program memory, it's just a little bit harder to do it, and you would have to, and you'd have to erase. Uh, several locations at once. You can't just erase one. I think I think it's eight locations at once. I'm not sure. In any event, it's just a, if you're going to do data, the data should be saved in the EEPROM as long as you don't need more than 50, 256 bytes. And then the next thing we have is we have our I.O. ports. We use the term general purpose input output port, GPIO, general purpose input output. And these GPIO ports uh, are divided into three ports, A, B, and C. And uh, I've been through this before, but I'm just going to do this again because I want you to know this. So port A uh, has, and I'll put my face back. Port A has uh, goes from RB5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. So it has uh, six pins. Port B has RB4, uh, 5, 6, and 7. So four pins, but, but port B, 0, 1, 2, 3 don't, don't exist. And in port A, uh, pins seven and six don't exist, uh, and in port C, all all the pins exist. There are eight uh, pins assigned to port C, uh, so that gives you your GPIO pins, and um, we have some of them in port A though are tied up with our in circuit serial programmer th that's going to be the snap. We have GP uh, we have port A, a zero and port A one that are tied up, and that does the serial communication. That's where how we program it. It's how we do the debug. So we can't generally use those pins for our program. Although there are ways around that, but we're not going to do those ways because uh, we we're not strapped for pins at this point. And then the other pin that's tied up is pin RA3, the master clear pin. Now we also went ahead and connected 
uh, all the various pins are connected uh, sort of uh, presumptively to certain functions. Uh, and that's why we have a header for the CR2102. It's got a couple of pins connected. We've got the analog header. It's got three pins connected. We've got the touch pads. There are four pins connected to them. We've got the push button RB7 that you can jumper uh, with on the three pin header to use as a push button. And that's connected to RB7 uh, and so forth. So we have some dedicated pins. Uh, our our I2C has two pull ups on it, which are required for the I2C, and that's RB4 and 6. So, so most of our most of our pins are already sort of spoken for in various ways, but uh, but you can use them you can use them for other things if you want. You just have to be aware what they might be uh, uh, sort of nominally uh, you know sort of preordained for. Okay, and then we have our RGB LED that has a uh, that has a green, uh, well, it has a red, blue, and green. And the green is is already connected. Now there's a there's a great document uh, on the web. Let me just pull that up. I would like to show that to you now. You, this this is something when you're working, especially on your project, you'll probably refer to frequently. So here's our here's our blackboard, and um, if we go down to the blackboard here, and we go into the pick lab right there, and we click on that, and it comes up. Then you see right here at the top, there's a document. Viva Board Revision 4.4 Pinouts. And if I click on that, and I already pointed this out when we did the homework. Um, let's see what, what happened to it. Uh, somewhere it didn't, didn't come up. I don't know what happened to it. Let's do it one more time. Oh, I did a save file instead of open. Yeah, okay, that's what happened. All right, anyway, um, so here it is. Notice notice that this uh, has, uh, it, it goes through all the things. So it talks about the CR2102 header, where we connect our UART to the USB input. Um, and that takes up our C4 and 5. We have our analog header, and that takes up AN6, 7, and 11, which are, which are assigned to RC2, 3, and, and RB5. The, the four touch buttons at the top that spell out UTSA are connected to RA4, RC7, RC1, and RC0, and they are capacitive touch sensing 3, 9, 5, and 4. The push buttons, RB7. The pick kit 3 header hooks up uh, RA0, RA1, and the master clear switch uh, button is, uh, or input is RA3. And then the, there's a two-pin uh, two female header for the transistor switch, which you can connect to any pins and, and control that switch, but it's not, it's not automatically connected to anything. Then there's the battery, uh, which you, you have to jumper to select either 5 or 3.3 volts, or you can power it from the CR2102 header. And that switch, kind of the, the, the big switch, determines which, whether you're doing the battery or the CR2102 header. Then you have the RGB LED. RA5 is green, RC6 is red, and RA2 is blue. And then we have uh, the I2C connections, RB4 and 6. We have uh, potential PWM outputs, uh, RC5, uh, RC2, R5, depending on uh, a setting on a, in a register, and RA2 and RC6. So some of these are already, these aren't really dedicated, uh, but uh, anyway. And there's some other ones too, but those are the main ones. All right, so um, that's where that is. So I want you to see that, and I'm gonna, now I'm gonna go put this back here. And, um, oh, I also wanted to point out, I do have on here, there's a, the, uh, the prereq quiz is now done. Let's see, and I thought, yeah, there's a folder right here. If you click on that folder, there's a 10 question quiz divided up into three little tests, uh, three questions, three questions, and four questions. And uh, they're divided up just to make the automatic grading work a little better for the ABET purposes. Uh, so each one should take just a few minutes, but you, you can have up to 15 minutes for each one. I don't think it'll take you that long. And, uh, and just to answer the questions, it doesn't count for your grade. Um, and I, I think I said this is the second part. It's actually the first part, second part, third part. 
Um, turns out it's real hard that it's real hard to change these. Uh, let's see if I can edit that. I don't think I can. Oh, I can. So I will. Okay, so. Okay, so that's the first part. Second part, third part. Okay, uh, so if you'll do that, that'll be great. Um, and then I think that's it. Um, all right, so then let me shrink this down and then um, continuing. So those are the ports and you can see they're all connected to, we, we thought through sort of optimal ways to hook them up, but they're, uh, but you can, most of them you can use for whatever you want. Even the things we've, can, even where we put pull-ups on them and stuff, they're, they'll still pretty much work for anything. All right, then we have all of our peripheral modules here. And this includes the timers, the A to D converter, the comparator, the UART, uh, the serial ports, uh, the, the, the enhanced capture, compare, and PWM uh, modules. Two of them are enhanced, two of them are just regular. Uh, and uh, there are some other ones that are not included in, included in here, like the capacitive touch sensing and some other stuff. And then finally, we have the clock module. And this clock module uh, uh, is very uh, powerful. It can do a bunch of different things. Uh, we're going to use the internal oscillator, but it, it does have the ability to have an external crystal resonator, or an external crystal, an external resonator, an external clock reference, and then the internal clock can output its clock. And I promised that I would, would uh, show you that on the oscilloscope, and I'm, I will do that. I guess I'll do all that Monday. Um, no, no demo, no scope. Uh. So I'll do that. I'll do that Tuesday. For, so for the lecture Tuesday, I'll have all that demo stuff in there. Um, okay. Um, so that's that. Now, how this is uh, how how the the core. So this is this is kind of mostly we've talking about the peripheral stuff, the memories and all the peripheral modules and the clock module. It, but let's look a little more kind of at what's in the CPU block diagram. This is all in the data sheet, by the way. Um, so here's kind of the core block diagram. Now I'm going to cover some things here. It, it also still includes the flash program memory, the data memory here. Uh, it includes the W register and some other stuff. And we're just going to talk about this in general. This looks kind of intimidating, but it, it really you really should look at this uh, because this is how the thing works. And this is really a, this is really a good good description. Uh, so we'll look at some things here. All right, first off, here is, here is, a, here is the, the internal oscillator module. And we're going to use, well, it's the oscillator module. It includes the internal oscillator and also the support for external chips and, uh, or for external uh, crystal or external resonator. Um, and a few other things, the watchdog timer, uh, the brownout, the power up, uh, and some other things. We're, n we're not going to use, uh, we will use the watchdog. Uh, but we're not gonna we're not gonna do uh, too much of this other stuff. So we're gonna use the internal oscillator block, and and we're gonna set it by writing a value into the oscillator control register at four megahertz, and then this instruction decode and control unit divides that down so that each instruction uh, has um, that takes four of the four megahertz clock cycles or every. Uh, or every one mega or the actual instruction cycle is one megahertz. So we execute an instruction every one millionth of a second at the rate of a million per second or one megahertz. All right, here's the program memory. You can see it's it's listed as 14 bits wide and it uh, it's addressed through this multiplexer over here and uh, it it sends and it has a 15 bit 15-bit address bus. So here's the 15 bits, and then it's also addressed over here. Here's the program counter. So this is normally where the 15 bits of address are delivered to the program memory, and it spits out an instruction into the instruction register. Now, uh, if that instruction register references a, a location in data memory, seven bits of that address come out here, and five bits 
combined with five bits from the BSR, the upper five bits, to generate a 12-bit address. And then this address goes into the address multiplexer and it can, it can, uh, it can select to take the address from, from this input or it can take it from the uh, file select register one, only 12 bits of it, and or from file select register zero, 12 bits there. And the, the multiplexer picks which of those 12 bits it's gonna use and addresses the random access memory. And then the data bus, which is bi-directional, sends its data, either, uh, either uh, eight bits of data come around and go to uh, the, uh, uh, in, either into the W register or uh, maybe into the arithmetic, uh, the arithmetic logic unit or, or, or uh, they may go in this way or they may uh, go into um, the status register or one of these file select registers and they uh, can also uh, get back to the, they also can write to the program memory. All right, so um, the thing I want you to really see, and let's see, I, I click on this. So there's the program memory. Here's the data memory. Let's see. Uh, okay, so the, yeah, so there's the program counter. And that's what picks the next instruction. Here's the instruction register where the instruction is loaded. Here's our 16 level hardware stack where we store return addresses when we go to subroutines or we, jump, or we do function calls or when we have an interrupt. And here's our W register. And you should notice that the arithmetic logic unit, so all of our arithmetic activities, addition, subtraction, uh, we don't do multiplication or division. Uh, we have to we have to uh, use addition and subtraction to get those done. So we have those are done in software. Uh, notice that the W register uh, takes data from the AC from the arithmetic logic unit, and it also sends data into the ALU. Uh, and every time the ALU uh, does something, it can affect the three status bits. It doesn't always, usually Usually, it only does that on, on additions and subtractions. And some other operations, maybe it'll affect the carry bit uh, or the zero bit. Um, and then uh, it can take constants from, the, uh, from an instruction. So an instruction can bring an immediate value and put it in here. And that can be eight bits. Or it can get eight bits from the data RAM. That can come in here. And then it'll pass through the AOU and wind up in either the W register or it may go back in the RAM. All right. I think that's um, pretty much all I wanted to do. Here's the status register. I think I've been over all those. So a couple of things to show. Uh, it, it doesn't show you how the control lines work. It just shows you how the data flows. It doesn't show how the power is routed around. Uh, notice we have a bunch of different memories, the flash, the data RAM, the stack, the registers. The EEPROM is not shown because it's uh, external to this. Uh, I don't know, they just didn't put it in. No, notice how the RAM address, when we're addressing RAM, notice how our typical RAM address from an instruction, seven bits from the instruction, five bits from the BSR, unless you use indirect addressing in which case then you reference FSR1 or FSR0. So since we're not going to do that, our addresses of data RAM are always going to come seven bits from the instruction, five bits from the BSR. So that's why the BSR has got to point to the right page. Um, and then notice how the AOU gets uh, eight bits from the instruction register, R for RAM, R from, the, re R from the W register, and it all goes in either to the W register or back into RAM. And then three bits go potentially to the status. Um, okay, the configuration in information is also up here. That's what we program in when we, when we flash the chip, and that's how we uh, set up all those configuration bits. They are really part of program memory. Okay, um, all right. So I'm not going to do this. Uh, I'm going to think I'm going to switch now to 
this one. And so what I want to do, so I want to talk about uh, an assembly language instruction. And what I want to point out uh, is that, that every instruction has, uh, has several fields, all right? Uh, and the fields are, you can have a label on every instruction, although normally, normally we'll just write the labels out separately and not associate them with a particular instruction, but, but they certainly can be. Uh, each ins every instruction has an operation code, and the labels are the only thing that should start in the first uh, column. You should not put your op, your op code in the first column. You should space in a little bit. Uh, the operation code defines what the instruction is. And then the instruction may have no operands. It may have one operand, or it could have two operands. That's the most. And uh, and then you can, you can also put a comment by putting a semicolon and a comment. So, uh, so the maximum fields you can have, one label, one opcode, first operand, comma, second operand, semicolon, comment. But sometimes we will, sometimes we won't. Uh, many of the instructions do have second operands, but many of them don't. Uh, and some of the ones we use most commonly don't. Okay, now, uh, so here's some example instructions. Now, first we have a label, start. Notice we just put that on the line by itself, and we started in the first column. Then we have a compiler directive called bank select, and we put in there the, uh, the name of the register that we want to point the bank, the BSR towards. And then, then what we do, we use this move local to W, or literal to W, I guess is what it really means, literal to W. And that literal value is eight bits stored in that instruction. And we're gonna see, we're gonna see about our literal instructions in a minute. And the value that we're gonna, gonna move to W is six alpha. So this is a constant here, and it's it's eight bits put into this 14-bit inst instruction. And that eight bits of six alpha hex is gonna get put in the W register. And then we're gonna move the W register into the file register, OSCON, because that's gonna set up the oscillator control register to run our internal clock, our internal oscillator clock at four megahertz. And if you go to the data sheet and go to the clock module, uh, you can see why we have to pick six alpha, and we'll, we'll do that eventually, but for right now, I'm just gonna, gonna skip past that. And then we have a bank select register. Uh, again, uh, uh, this is a compiler directive. It's not a register, it's a compiler directive. And uh, we're gonna bank select for TRIS-C. That's because TRIS-C might be in a different bank than OSCON. We don't actually have to know we just put tris c there and now we know now we know that the bank that this compiler directive will make the compiler generate an instruction to load the bsr with the correct bank number for tris c and then we're going to clear it making every bit in and making all the pins in in the c port outputs because our our tris register is essentially our data direction register for every one of the for each of our three ports, Tris A, Tris B, and Tris C. So here we're sending all, of, all the bits in C, we're making outputs. Uh, then we do another bank select, and we put in port C. And that's just the, the port. Now we have two different ways to, re to reference every bank. One is using the port, and another one is using the, the, the latch. And we'll talk about when you want to use the port, when you want to use the latch, and what's the difference between them. Um, but we'll get to that. And then we're going to use this clear F instruction to uh, clear everything in port C, so it just makes it all zero. And over here we put a comment, init port C. So we're just going to set port C to be all zeros. Um, okay. Now the nice thing is the the, the editor in the IDE uh, will keep will kind of keep you straight. It color codes comments differently uh, than, than, op, than instructions, differently than, uh, than registers and, and variables and things like that. So it does kind of help you, and labels are different as well. And it'll, it'll often give you an error if you're doing something wrong so you can correct your syntax. Okay, 
Now I'm going to go th now. I'm, uh, now what I want to do is I want to I want to switch the actual instruction set and go through it. Now let me first uh, bring up the data sheet and show you where that is in the data sheet. So I'm going to I'm going to shrink this down, uh, and then I'm going to pull up the data sheet, which is right here, and it's also on Blackboard, and you can just Google it from anywhere. All you have to do is type in PIC 16 F 1829 data sheet and it'll come up. You could also type in PIC 16LF 1829 or PIC 16LF 1825 or PIC 16F 1825 and the same data sheet would come up. All right, because it covers both the 1825 and the 1829, but you're using the 29. The 25 just has fewer pins and so some of the things uh, don't pertain to the 25, but, but everything pertains to the 29. And this gives you sort of an intro. But to get to the instruction set, you can bring up the little uh, um, outline here so you know where to go and you go down here to, to chapter 20 uh, sorry chapter uh, 29 instruction set and then there's some things you can read here let's see oh you can't see this my bad okay so here's the data sheet and uh, we're gonna go down here to, inst to uh, instruction set 20 uh, instru chapter 29 instruction set summary and here it is all right, let me blow it up a little bit here. And now, what I want you to see, um, there are some there are some things that are really nice over here, because well, first let me scroll down. If you scroll down a little bit, you'll see this is this this is the general format for all different types of instructions. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different instructions. That's it. Um, some of these instructions only have uh, we're not even going to use, um, and and they they some of them only have one instruction that's in this format. Some of them have a lot of instructions. So this general this general uh, so this this uh, so this is the byte oriented file register instruction. We're going to use these a lot, and I I want you to look at this and the bit oriented. These two uh, instruction formats I want you to know, and here's how they work. This, this byte oriented has an opcode that has a single D bit and then it has uh, seven bits of address. Remember, when we reference a, a byte in our random access memory or one of the special function registers associated with one of the modules, we, we get seven bits of that address in our actual instruction and we have then uh, the other five bits are in the BSR. And this one bit, this D bit, I'll explain that in a minute. But that tells us where the result of the of this instruction, whatever it might be, where the result is to be left. Because we do have two choices. The D can be a zero, which means the destination for the result is the W register, or the D can be one, which means the destination is in the file register specified here. And remember the BSR. Uh, most of the time the BSR has to also point to the correct bank. If you're using one of the core registers, you don't have to worry about being in the right bank. And if you're using one of the upper seven random access locations in the, uh, the sorry, upper 15 random access locations in the first bank, they're mapped to every bank as well. So then you could be in any bank, you'll still be okay. But all, all the other random access locations and all the other special function registers, you must be in the correct bank for those. Um, and then this is the bit oriented file register instruction and again I'll come back and look at those you have the opcode uh, and then you have a three bit designation that tells you which bit you're going to mess with and then you still have a seven bit uh, a seven bit uh, address of your random access location or your file register or your special function register again the other five bits have to be in the BSR so these two registers, and then there's one more that's very common that we'll use a lot, and that's called the literal. And this opcodes here, and then you have eight bits, which represents the actual data. And then we have our branch. This is call and go to. You get uh, you get 11 bits of uh, two's complement address, and then in the, the branch always instruction you only get nine bits. So you can see 
The branch always can't branch as far forward and backward as the go to. There's really, I don't know why they even created this instruction. It, it, there's no advantage in using the BRA over the go to. So you, they might as well just only have the go to. Uh, but in any event, that's why it's that's there. All right. Uh, I'm going to, now we're going to look at the actual instruction set. So here, here, here is the entire list of instructions. They're divided into several different types. And some of these types match these formats up here. The first one is the one we just looked at, and that's the byte-oriented file register instructions. And this shows you the 14 bits and how they have to be. So first of all, here, here is the mnemonic. So this is what you write in your code. Uh, if you want to add uh, W to F, you, you write ADDWF. If you want to add W to F and also add in the carry bit, then you would add ADDWFC. And notice you have two operands for these instructions. You have the seven bits of the, of the address, the F, and you have the one bit of the destination, which means leave the result in either the W register or the file register that you're adding. And it adds the W register and the file register. The file register is the register you're specifying by that seven bits of address for F. And it could be any of the random access memory locations or it could be any special function register, um, that at least that you're allowed to read. Um, uh, there are some special function registers that you can only write, some that you can only read, some most you can read and write. Uh, all right, and notice the various things you can do. You can add without carry, you can add with carry. You can and W to F. You can arithmetic shift right. You can logical shift left. You can logical shift right. You can clear. Here you can clear F, and then this one is clear W. You can complement F, which you mean you uh, take every bit in F and you flip it. And again, for all, all these except for the clear F and clear W, you can leave the result either in W or F. Uh, you can decrement F. You can increment F. You can inclusive or W with F. And down here, you can exclusive or W with F. You can move F, which means you typically would move it to W, although you still have this D bit, which means you can move it to itself. Now, why would you want to move F to itself? Normally, you'd want to move it to W, right? So you would your second operand would be 0, or instead of writing a 0, you can just put W there, and the uh, assembler will put a 0 in for you. And uh, the... You can, the only reason for moving it to itself is that it does set the Z bit. And since it sets the Z bit, that is one way to test if a location is zero or not. You can move W to F. So you take the contents of W and you move it to F. Notice here, there is no second operand because it's always going to take W and move it to F. So where the result left will always be an F. And then you can rotate left through the carry bit you can rotate right through the carry bit. I'll explain those later. You can subtract W from F, and you can subtract W from F with a borrow. That's basically with the carry bit. And then you can swap nibbles. Now, a number of students have, have seized upon this thinking they could swap two bytes. You can't. You can only swap uh, the lower four bits with the upper four bits in a single byte, specified by the seven bits of F and the bank select register. And then again, that's the exclusive OR. So those are all the byte-oriented functions you can do. And it covers pretty much everything you would need. Now we have one more byte-oriented, but these are special. These are skip operations. And we're going to use these for our for loops in assembly language. One of The one we're going to use is decrement F skip on zero. We're not going to really use increment F skip on zero. You could, but it's, uh, it's easier to make sense out of the decrement F. And the way that works, you preload a value in F uh, using one of these up here, or one of our immediate instructions we'll show you in a minute. And then you put this at the end, and you every time you get down here, you decrement F and skip on zero. And you, you make sure that second operand leaves the result in F. Uh, and so you subtract one from F and overwrite it. And uh, each time you come through, you subtract one from F. When you finally subtract the last one from F and now it's zero, you will skip the next instruction instead of executing it. 
and you make the next instruction is typically the branch that takes you back to the top of your loop. So when you skip that branch, you drop out of the loop and go on with the rest of your program. Now we have the, the bit-oriented uh, instructions, uh, and these, these are very useful. You don't really have these in C. In C, you have to use a mask, but in assembly language, you can use these instructions, and you'll find you, you'll like these instructions, and you'll miss them when you get to C. Uh, bit clear F and bit set F. So you specify a file register or a special function register, and then you get a 3-bit B that says whether to affect bit 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or bit 7. And this B is a 3-bit uh, field. And you can clear a bit, and you can set a bit. And that's how we'll turn on and off an LED. Remember, in our LEDs, since, they're, since they have a common anode, the cathodes are what are connected to our individual pins. And so to make it turn it on, you have to ground the pin. And to turn it off, you have to make the pin high. Then we have these bit test F skip on clear. This is what we'll use to check our push button. And uh, you can check that if the push button is pushed, uh, it will, the bit will be clear. If the, if the bit is set, if the, bit is not, if the button is not pushed, the bit will be set. And this, uh, th this three bit B lets you pick which bit in the uh, file register location specified by F you're actually testing, or in the case of these two, setting or clearing. Okay, now we have the last group here that I'm going to really talk about. These are, these are super important. These are called the literal operations. And uh, 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 so there, there are several that deal with the W register. Add a literal to W, and a literal with W, inclusive or a literal with W, exclusive or a literal with W, subtract a literal from W. And then finally, the one you're going to move, use the most is move a literal to W. Now, I'm going to, uh, the others are pretty straightforward, but I'm going to do this move a literal to W. So when you want to load a value into W, you, you would write an instruction, MOV LW, and then you put the value you want to load into W in the instruction. And all these instructions have that second operand, which is uh, typically 8 bits, although for, uh, for two of them it's not. The two of them that, that are kind of weird here are move literal to the BSR. Well, the BSR only has 5 bits. The upper, uh, two, uh, the upper 3 bits are not used. And so you only get a 5-bit literal. And then move literal to the, uh, to the uh, PC latch high. And that's only, that PC latch high, remember it's only 7 bits, so the K there is only 7. But all the rest of the Ks are 8 bits. And they apply to the W register. Move literal to W is the one we're going to use a lot. Remember, there's no second operand with any of these literals. And, and all, the, all the literals involving W have an 8-bit uh, operand, second operand, or first, operand, oh, first and only operand. Okay, now we'll talk about just a few more instructions. This is all the rest of the instructions right here. This is it. Uh, some of them we're not going to really talk about. Some of these C compiler optimized stuff we're not going to pay any attention to. And, uh, but we do need to look at these control operations. And so uh, we have the uh, branch always and the uh, go to. We also have a call where you can call a subroutine. Now the difference between a go to and a call, on a call, you save the address, that, uh, the, the, next, the, value, the, the address of the instruction right after your call, and it will, it will uh, once you finish with the subroutine, it comes back and starts continuing right from where you left off with the call. Uh, so it's just like a function call. Um, the go to, though, transfers control to a new location. And we, we typically use this when we're setting up a for loop. And, and we'll put this instruction right after our decrement f uh, skip on 0 uh, instruction. And uh, we'll keep looping until we decrement our, our counter down to 0, and then we drop through. And we'll show you how to do that. But it's basically it's the assembly language equivalent of a for loop. Um, and then we have return from interrupt, uh, 
return uh, with a literal in W, and then we have a return from subroutine. So this, we're not going to, well, these all have, oh, two things we, uh, two things we probably won't mess with is branch relative with W and, and call subroutine uh, relative with W. So you can preload something in W and then use that to adjust a branch. You might do that if you're indexing your way, uh, processing a bunch of stuff in a, in a matrix and you want to index your way through these values, you, you could do that maybe. I don't know. Uh, there's, there's, there's occasions where it could be useful, but I, I don't think I've ever used it. So, um, And it may also be stuff that, uh, that C might, might use. Then there's, then there's a few kind of weird ducks. Uh, one of these is a legacy instruction called Tris. Uh, ignore that. We're never gonna, we're never gonna mess with that. Um, uh, we're just gonna, we're you, you. It is a shorthand, but we're not gonna use this shorthand because it's, it's a legacy thing. And the sleep instruction. When we do the sleep lab, we'll, we'll issue the sleep instruction. There's a reset instruction which automatically resets everything. You might use this in an in an error uh, when you're if you if you have an error problem, you might want to reset the whole chip if you detect an error. So you might use that in an error in a portion of code that was dealing with an error operation error. Um, the option register is also another legacy instruction we're not going to use. Uh, uh, and then the no op uh, that's a placeholder instruction. It it does it does nothing. It just takes up one instruction cycle, and but sometimes when you're writing code, uh, you may need to put that in as like a play like a placeholder just to do a little t short timing loop, uh, or you might um, you might um, put it there and then come back later on and write in the instruction you need there. I don't know. Anyway, um, and then uh, clear watchdog timer. We'll use this when we do the sleep and watchdog uh, lab. And you'll see uh, if you clear the if you don't clear the watchdog timer, then if if it times out, it resets the chip, uh, or can also wake the chip up depending on how you're using it. And then we have these compiler optimized things, which um, which um, anyway, I'm I'm not going to talk about. But but this allows you to. Uh, this allows you to use the W register, and you can do pre and post, increment and decrement with modifiers, uh, and you can do indexed indirect and all sorts of things. Um, so, and C uses these a lot. Uh, so that's how C does most of its. In fact, C does everything through the indirect registers. So that's how C works. Okay. Um, so let, I want to talk about, I'm kind of running out of time, but I want to talk about a couple of specific instructions. And um, so I think what I'm going to do is switch to uh, uh, switch over to the, uh, uh, to the little tablet. So I'll move this over and we'll expand it. And I'll put my face back in here. All right, so so a couple of things. Now let let's say let's say we wanted to um, let's say we let let's 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 talk about the uh, say the oscillator control register. Maybe before we do this, I'll bring up the data sheet again, and uh, let's see if I still have the data sheet here. I hope I do. Yeah. Okay. Here's the data sheet. So I'm going to go. I'm going to go back here using the index, which is always the way to get around, and I'm going to go to the uh, to our uh, to our uh, oscillator module. So internal uh, oscillator module, chapter five. Okay, so you should read through this. I think I assigned it in one of the homeworks. Eventually, you'll get to it. Uh, here's a block diagram, and you can see. Uh, this is where we pick what frequency we want our internal clock to run at. The, the register that controls that, there's, there's several registers that, that have to do with this module, but if you scroll to the end, um, here, uh, oh, I should have gone the other way, I'll do it. Uh, okay, oh man. 
we're coming. Okay, here's the oscillator control register. Now this this is the really the only one we have to worry about, and this is really nice because some some chips have a clock module so complicated, it, it takes you a week or two just to figure out how to get the clock turned on. But so we have a couple of things. First off, you can you we we do have a uh, a phase lock loop that we might need for some frequencies, and uh, you'll see the, some of these frequencies have a one. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, yeah, um, I forget. Uh, some of them do. Um, yeah, okay. Some of them give a couple. Uh, so to get all the way to 32 megahertz, you have to use the phase lock loop. For most of the other things, you you can you can get to them. I think if you want to do 8 megahertz, you also have to do the phase lock loop. But you can do 16 megahertz without it two without it, or all the rest of them, you don't have to turn it on. So anyway, um, what we're going to do, we want to do four megahertz. Uh, now, you don't have to do that, but this just works out to be a nice value. It lets the clock run slow enough for some things, but fast enough for other things. You can pick different values for different reasons, but this, is the, this, is, this works pretty well for most general stuff. And to do that, you have to put in the IRCF field, bits 3, 2, 1, and 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. Okay, so down here in this, in, in uh, this, sorry, this field here, you need 1, 1, 0, 1. We want to leave the, this bit off, so our, uh, and our configuration word, uh, we have, we have, uh, uh, we have turned it off, so we want to make this 0, so it's disabled. So we put a zero here, and then we put a one one zero one, one one zero one here. This is un uh, unused, so we put a zero there, and then the SCS. Uh, we want to use the uh, internal oscillator block, not timer one, and not a. Uh, well, and you can use the clock determined by F OS and configuration word one, since we set it for internal oscillator. We can we could either put one x or zero zero doesn't matter, but you, this allows you to override what's in the configuration word basically. But we're going to put in zero zero. We'll just use what's in the configuration word, and so we'll we'll do zero zero. So basically, when you're all said and done, you want zero one one zero, which is six, and then it's one zero zero zero, which is eight. So we want sixty eight hex to be written into this word. All right, so that's how you figure this out. And usually what I'll do, uh, usually what I'll do is I'll just go down, I'll, write, I'll, I'll put the configuration word in like this. And then, so here's our soft software. And then here's our four bit field, one, one, zero, one. Here's our, our unused bit. And then we'll put zero, zero in here. So then, then that means this is, these four bits are six hex and these four bits are eight. So that gives us zero X sixty eight. That's the value we need to write in. And I, I, I think that's really important to, to do that. So you get so you so you you know why you pick these numbers and make sense to you. Alright, so we want to load that in the OSCON register. And the OSCON register's name, and you can get it again, you can get it straight off the data sheet, right? Um uh, where is my This is harder than you think. It's right here. So it's OSCCON. The name up here on all these registers in the data sheet is generally the name that's in our, in our include file that allows us to, instead of having to look up and figure out where this register actually is, we can just use the name. If we were going to use the actual number, here's what we would have to do. But again, we're not going to do this because that's a pain in the butt. But it's the OSCON register, so we go down here in our in all our memory banks and we find where that is. We could search for it; it'll pop up pretty quickly. So where is OSCON? Ah, it's right here. So there it is. There it is, right there in the OSCON register, right here. That's in bank one. So the actual address there is 099 hex. The lower seven bits go in the instruction and the upper 
the upper uh, five bits go in the BSR. The upper five bits are going to be 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. And the lower five bits are going to be uh, the lower five bits are going to be one nine hex. So that's how that works. Uh, so in our instruction, the when we put OSCON in there, it'll actually put 19 hex in our instruction, and and then when we do the bank cell OSCON, it'll put one in the BSR. And the way it, the bank cell works is it uses one of those that literal instruction for the BSR. Uh, MOV, MOVB, uh, MOVLB, one, and it puts a one in the BSR. So the that compiler directive creates that instruction for us automatically, which is nice. Otherwise, we'd have to go to this chart and figure everything out. So by using the name, we don't actually have to know that it is at 99 hex. Then that's that's nice. It's really a helpful thing. Okay. So so now. How does this work? Well, so we're gonna I'm gonna do a little code segment and show you how this would look in code. So the first thing we do, we don't we don't put anything over here in the label field. So we skip that. We 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 um, tab in and we write bank cell. And I think you can put it in upper or lowercase. Doesn't matter. Bank cell, but the OSCON has to be uppercase. OSCCON. And then what this is going to generate automatically for us, whether we know it or not, it's going to generate a MOVLB0x01 instruction. And it's going to stick it in the code right where we have the bank cell. But, but this happens automatically. Now, we could just write this ourselves, but we'd have to know that the OSCON is in bank one if we did that. All right. Now, we're going to write our instruction. So first thing we're going to do, we want to put 68 into the W register because this is the only way you can do it. So we're going to we're going to do that, and to do that, we're going to use a M O V L W instruction. There's only one operand required, and that's the that's the constant we're going to load in. In this case, we're going to write in 0x68. You could write it in decimal if you wanted, but the 68 keeps it straight. It's a pain to convert this to decimal, and it's much easier to convert these four bits to a hex bit and these four bits to a hex bit than it is, and write 68, than it is to figure out then what it is in decimal. Uh, but in decimal, it would be what? The zero, or one, two, so four, uh, eight, 16, so that's 20, uh, uh, 32, 64, 128. So 64 plus 128 plus uh, 20, whatever that is. That's the actual that's the actual decimal number. But why bother with that, right? We'll just use hex. Okay. Now, now, now we have this value in the W register, but it's still not in the OSCON register. How can we get into the OSCON register? Well, now we can do M O V move W to F. Now this instruction does not require that. This is one of the byte-oriented instructions, but it doesn't take a second operand. And all, now all we have to do is specify OSCON. And that's why we have to have this bank select instruction here so that the BSR is pointing to the right bank. It doesn't have to point to the W register. It's in the core registers. It's mapped into every bank, so we don't have to worry about it. It automatically happens with this instruction. But with the OSCON register, we must do the, BS, the bank select first Otherwise, we wouldn't necessarily get it into the right register. Uh, it could go in some other bank. It would be in a different register. And then, now that takes care of that. Uh, and so that is how we would configure the oscillator to be at 68. And then, uh, I'll, uh, I, I think we're kind of over, almost over time. So I think I'm going to stop here. And uh, I'll talk about, uh, I'll pick up and we'll continue to work through this program. But I want you to see, uh, you know, how this works. Uh, now, remember, the most important thing for these instructions is to remember that that seven bits, seven bits for these byte-oriented instruction of the address are in the instruction, and five are in the BSR. Unless, of course, you're talking about the core registers. Unless you're talking about the core registers, or that. 15 uh, 
uh, uh, common RAM. That's the upper fifth, uh, upper, it's actually 16. The 16 registers a common RAM. It's the upper 16 in the first bank are mapped to every bank. So these two things, you don't have to mess with the BSR. Everything else you do. All the special function registers that are not core registers and all of the other RAM locations that are not in that 16 uh, bytes of common RAM. All right. So keep that in mind, and we will pick up there then on uh, Tuesday. Have a good uh, Labor Day, and we'll see, uh, hopefully, some of you in lab finishing up soldering your boards this week. Again, we're just going to cancel the lab because I don't have the snaps yet. Um, if you want to come to lab and work on it, that's fine. We will have some programmers there, so you can do that. Um, but, it, but you don't have to. Uh, and make sure you get MP Lab X loaded down, downloaded and, and, and working on your machine. Um, and you can go ahead and type in the code and play with it. You can even actually set it up as simulation if you want. It will run the simulation. But, um, but, um, but we don't have the programmers to actually program your chip lab. But if you come to lab, <clears throat> we will program your chip. We've got some extra programmers in lab. All right. We will see you then.